Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Future Prospects for Historic Vision in Patients with Glaucoma, with Dr. Thomas Johnson III. My name is Elena Sturman. I am the president and CEO of the Glaucoma Foundation. Our mission at TGF is to improve the lives of glaucoma patients by encouraging and supporting innovative research and providing news and education for scientists, physicians, patients, and the public. Regenerative medicine holds tremendous potential for restoring vision in patients suffering from neurodegenerative diseases and reversing vision loss in glaucoma is no exception. Tonight, we are going to learn where the science is now and what obstacles still needs to be hurdled before we can achieve optic nerve regeneration to restore vision in humans. Our guest speaker today is Thomas Johnson III. He is a clinician scientist and the Allen and Shelley Halt Rising Professor of Ophthalmology at the Wilmer Eye Institute at John Hopkins. He completed his PhD in neuroscience at the University of Cambridge, where his doctoral research involved directing a collaborative project between a stem cell lab at Cambridge and a molecular biology lab at the National Eye Institute's NIH Intramural Research Program. He has been at Johns Hopkins since 2010, where he completed medical school, an ophthalmology residency, and glaucoma fellowship. Dr. Johnson is a glaucoma specialist. He treats patients in the clinic and OR one to two days a week. The remainder of his time in spent, is spent in his translational neuroscience lab, where he is investigating retinal ganglion cell replacement therapies for vision restoration in glaucoma and other optic neuropathies. He also has a clinical interest in understanding the relationship between intraocular pressure and glaucoma progression, especially through remote and 24-hour tonometry. As always, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation. Mm -hmm. You can pose your question at any time by using mm -hmm. the chat button, and we look forward to answering many of them. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Johnson III. Let's begin. Great. Well, thank you very much, Elena, and to the Glaucoma Foundation for uh, hosting this talk. It's really a pleasure to be here and speak to you all this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Well, as Elena mentioned, I am a clinician scientist. So I'm a practicing glaucoma specialist, and I treat patients with glaucoma. Uh, but I also have a translational neuroscience laboratory here at Johns Hopkins. And tonight I'm going to tell you about some of the work that we're doing in that laboratory uh, with an aim of developing new innovative therapies that can help glaucoma patients, not just by slowing down the progression of their disease like we can now, but by doing something that currently uh, we have no way of doing, and that's actually restoring vision for patients that have glaucoma and other optic neuropathies. So I wanna start by just discussing a little bit about what glaucoma actually does. Uh, some of you on this call may actually have glaucoma and you may be aware that when glaucoma is described, oftentimes people talk about uh, tunnel vision or a uh, loss of the peripheral or side vision so that it looks like you're looking through a tunnel. And oftentimes on the internet and in presentations, that's depicted uh, as shown on this slide here, where a person without vision loss might see this uh, landscape with uh, houses and a couple of cars as shown on the left. And then someone on the right, supposedly with glaucoma, might see it uh, where they with vision loss in the periphery and only good vision in the center. But an interesting study that was conducted a few years ago by David Crabb and colleagues suggested that glaucoma patients don't actually perceive the world in that way. Uh, the brain is actually remarkably good at filling in gaps of missing vision. And so patients with glaucoma don't uh, sense that they have a black area of missing vision in their periphery. Instead, they see more as though the periphery of their vision has areas of blurring, like shown here in this picture, 
or the brain will actually just fill in gaps and there will be missing areas of vision. Like here, this door is missing over here and part of this car is missing over here. And this explains why in part glaucoma is anecdotally called the sneak thief of sight. Uh, besides being painless, Glaucoma is very slowly progressive, and because your brain has tricks like this to fill in gaps in the missing vision, it's easy to see why a lot of people might not know they have glaucoma until it's at a very severe stage. We also know that if glaucoma is left untreated, it's one of the few eye diseases that really can cause total and complete blindness, where a patient's not even able to detect light. So that's the problem with glaucoma. And uh, right now, as you probably know, vision loss from glaucoma is currently irreversible. We have ways to slow down or halt the uh, progression of the disease, and that works by lowering eye pressure. Uh, here on the left, you see examples of the optic nerve head. And this is what your glaucoma doctor or your ophthalmologist is looking at when they shine that really bright light in your eyes while they're holding a lens. On the top is an example of a normal healthy optic nerve. You can see it's almost shaped like a donut where there's an orange rim of healthy nerve tissue with blood vessels coming out and then sort of a yellow hole in the center, which is like the hole in a donut. On the bottom is an optic nerve from a patient with really severe glaucoma. And what's happened here is this orange ring of healthy nerve tissue has disappeared. In other words, the dough of the donut is gone and you're left with just a giant hole. Uh, so patients like this with severe glaucoma uh, have a very remarkable degree typically of vision loss. And our goal as glaucoma patients, uh, glaucoma specialists, is to prevent patients like this from ending up like this with severe glaucoma. And we do that by giving eye drops or lasers or surgeries uh, to slow down disease progression. But as some of you may know, treatments don't always work as well as we would like. Sometimes surgeries have risks. Uh, and many patients are diagnosed after severe damage has already occurred. So for all of those reasons, it would be wonderful if we had treatments that could actually turn back the clock and restore some of the healthy nerve tissue within the optic nerve head and actually bring back vision that's been lost. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about tonight. But in order to appreciate and understand some of the work we're doing, we have to go into a little bit of background about uh, the physiology and neuroscience behind glaucoma to understand what glaucoma really is on a cellular level. So glaucoma is an optic neuropathy, and that means that it is a neurodegenerative disease of the optic nerve. As you can see in this picture here, the optic nerve is the cable that connects the eyeball to the brain. It's this yellow structure right here that comes out the back of the eye and goes through the skull into the parts of the brain that uh, support vision. This is a schematic of what happens to the fibers within the nerve after they get into the head and uh, start entering the brain. These fibers uh, have a pattern where some of them will cross to the other side of the brain, some of them will stay on the same side. Uh, but the important thing I want you to understand here is that there are some very precise locations inside the brain that these optic nerve fibers need to end up in order to support vision for, for people. Uh, these parts of the brain, one of the most common ones is called the LGN or lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. This is a really important brain structure that's meant to receive visual information from the eye and then start to turn that into an interpretable picture so that people actually have a sensation of sight. Uh, and during development, the connections between the eye to the brain are made in very precise and stereotyped fashion that allows us to see. Now, what are these optic nerve fibers really? Well, the optic nerve is itself a structure that is composed of hundreds of thousands, or in some cases, millions 
of cellular fibers. And the cells that send these fibers into the optic nerve are called retinal ganglion cells or RGCs. RGCs are a type of neuron. It's a nerve cell uh, and they're found within the retina. This is an example of a retina of a mouse. Uh, and you know, in this particular case, it looks like a cross, a Maltese cross, but that's just because the scientists who made this picture have cut uh, little incisions into the retina in order to flat mount it onto a slide. Normally the retina is a semi-sphere. It is the wallpaper that lines the back wall of the eye. And in this particular genetically mutated mouse, uh, there's been changes made to the structure of the genome so that some of the retinal ganglion cells express a blue fluorescent protein. And so each of these little dots that you see in this retina represent an individual retinal ganglion cell. And you can see here that there are hundreds, if not maybe a thousand or two cells labeled in this retina. But this represents only about 1% of the total RGCs that are in this retina. Every retina from mice and rats and even humans has uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of retinal ganglion cells that tile across the retina. Now, these cells have two other important components to them. And I'll talk about those as we look at this magnified view of some retinal ganglion cells in the top right. First of all, you can see that at the center of each cell is a, a circular structure, that's the cell body. And then coming out from the cell body are these little finger-like projections. These are called dendrites. And these projections go into the retina itself. This is down here, you're looking at a um, orthogonal projection, which means if you can imagine taking this top-down view of the retina where you're viewing it straight on and flipping it 90 degrees so that you're now look at it, looking at it from its side, you can now see that these dendrites actually project downwards into the retina. And their job is to make communication stations or synapses with the other types of cells within the retina. And I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing that you'll notice about these RGCs is that they each send a really long single neurite process. And in this case, they're all sort of heading in the same direction. Uh, this process is called the axon. And they're all heading in the same direction because in this particular blown up image, the optic nerve is up to the top right hand side of this picture. Again, if you look over here, all of these blue axons are all headed straight towards the optic nerve. And in fact, these axons will end up making a 90 degree turn and going out the back of your computer screen. And when they do that, they form that structure, that fiber optic cable that we call the optic nerve. Now, here is another schematic view of the retina. So again, we're talking, if this is the eyeball up here in cross-section, the retina is the wallpaper that lines the back wall of the eye. And the retina is a light-sensitive tissue. It's, it's neural tissue, just like the brain or the spinal cord. And it's uh, composed of several different types of neurons. So I'm going to describe those because it's important to understand how those cells interact to uh, really understand what we're trying to do in restoring vision for glaucoma. So light enters the eye and it's focused by the lens inside the eye before it hits the retina on the back wall of the eye. And the light passes through the most superficial layers of the retina until it hits these cells in the way back. These are called photoreceptors. There's two types. You've probably heard of rods and cones. So the rods and cones are able to absorb photons of light and then convert that light into an electrochemical signal. And this is uh, then how this information is conveyed within the nervous system of patients and humans and lab animals. So the photoreceptors, upon sensing this light, send an electrochemical signal through the synapse 
to the next cell in the retina, which is called the bipolar cell. Those are these pink cells right here. The bipolar cells then begin to encode the information about that light and then send that to the next cell in the sequence, these teal cells up here. And these are the retinal ganglion cells, the RGCs. So as you can see in the schematic here, they have a cell body that is all lined up in a row here. And then they have tiny little projections that are diving deeper into the retina. These are the dendrites that are forming communication stations with the bipolar cells. And then each of these retinal ganglion cells has an axon that projects up into this most superficial layer called the retinal nerve fiber layer of the retina. And then all of those axons run along the surface of the retina until they get to the optic nerve where they then project to the brain. So when patients with glaucoma experience vision loss, what is actually happening to them is that their retinal ganglion cells are dying. So again, this is another schematic of the retina and the projections of the retinal ganglion cells to the optic nerve. The RGCs are the dark teal cells here. Uh, they live in the retina. They project through the optic nerve and into the brain. And when a patient has glaucoma, the eye pressure inside the eye is causing some change at the level of the optic nerve head, either through biomechanical stress or blood flow issues that lead to the death of these retinal ganglion cells. And we know that because if we take optic nerves of patients that have passed away and donated their tissues to science, uh, we can count and quantify the number of retinal ganglion cell axons that are still present in the optic nerve. And a healthy optic nerve on the right has millions of tiny little axons in cross-section. And somebody with moderate glaucoma has these notable regions here where the retinal ganglion cell axons have died and now there's just scar tissue left in place. So in order to restore vision for patients with glaucoma, we need to actually regenerate these retinal ganglion cells that have been lost. And the problem for all mammals, which includes patients, is that the central nervous system does not possess inherent regenerative capacity, meaning that if there's damage to the brain or the spinal cord or the optic nerve, that damage is permanent because human beings do not automatically replace these retinoganglion cells if they've died. So the whole idea behind regenerative medicine is that we might be able to use stem cells or other technologies to bring back or generate new types of neurons after they've been lost. And right now is an incredibly exciting time for neuroscience and ophthalmology because uh, regenerative medicine approaches to treating historically incurable diseases are being developed and trialed in human patients. Just a few months ago, there was a press release from the National Institutes of Health that the first patient with uh, age-related macular degeneration in the United States underwent a surgery where stem cell-derived retinal pigment epithelium was transplanted underneath the retina in order to replace the type of cell that uh, dies early in that particular disease. And so, you know, clinical trials are underway and for AMD, and other diseases of the retina, we might have stem cell-based treatments available for patients within a matter of just a couple of years. But I wanna make the point that glaucoma, unfortunately, is a little bit more complicated than macular degeneration. And that goes back to the inherent complexity of the type of cell that we need to replace. The retinoganglion cells uh, connect both in the retina and in the brain. And so there are a number of very challenging things that we'll need to do as scientists in order to develop therapies that can actually be translated into clinical treatments for human patients. On the left here, you see just some of the uh, major obstacles that need to be overcome in order to develop such treatments. 
We need to be able to, to create new retinal ganglion cells from stem cells uh, and be able to transplant those cells into the eye. And then once they're transplanted into the eye, they need to be able to survive and migrate into the retina. And once in the retina, they need to create new communication stations in both directions. They need to regrow those dendrites down into the retina so that they can receive information about light from the bipolar cells. And then they need to grow really long axons through the optic nerve and into the brain. And as I mentioned before, they can't just go anywhere in the brain. They have to go to very precise locations in the brain that are expecting to receive information about light entering the eye so that it can use that information to create interpretable pictures uh, that patients will understand as sight. So all of these things put together sound like a pretty tall order. And I agree that this is a major challenge. Uh, for decades, the idea of trying to accomplish this feat was considered science fiction. Uh, but what I want to tell you about now is that I think uh, there have been tremendous advances in numerous fields of science in the last 10 years, such that many of these individual steps have actually been accomplished in very specific model systems and circumstances. And I think that if we can now put together some of the findings and observations that have been made in these isolated experiments, we might actually have a shot at regenerating retinal ganglion cells throughout the entirety of the visual pathway. So first I wanna talk about work that's been done to create the tools that we need to regenerate RGCs. And that is developing new RGCs from stem cells in a dish. There have been several uh, investigators and laboratories all over the world that have come up with uh, different ways to do this over the past several years. But one particular method that I want to highlight uh, was developed by Don Zach here at Johns Hopkins and members of his laboratory. Uh, they've used CRISPR-Cas9 gene engineering to create human stem cells that have some really special properties. They begin to glow red with a fluorescent protein after they turn into retinal ganglion cells, after being differentiated from a stem cell state into a retinal ganglion cell neuronal state. And Dr. Zach's lab has developed methodologies by working out a cocktail of chemicals and growth factors and other small molecules that direct stem cells to adopt a retinal ganglion cell fate over the course of about one month. Now, since we have induced pluripotent stem cells, meaning we can create stem cells in a dish from any human patient we want using something as simple as a blood sample or a skin biopsy or even a urine sample, that means we can now create RGCs from any patient in the world and we uh, can have them express a reporter marker. So in this case, they'll glow red. And when we study them, we can track them over time and look at their structure and function following transplantation. The other major breakthrough has been finding some of the um, inhibitory and uh, permissive cues that allow retinal ganglion cells to regenerate their axons very long distances. And the work that I'm citing here uh, was not done with transplanted stem cell derived RGCs, but rather with endogenous retinal ganglion cells. So uh, this is an experimental paradigm where uh, lab mice can uh, be exposed to an optic nerve crush injury, a traumatic injury. And if you do that, here we're looking at the optic nerve in cross-section uh, longitudinally. So the eye would be up here, the optic nerve would go across your screen, and the brain would be somewhere on the right. And under the normal circumstances, if you label the retinal ganglion cell axons in green, and then you crush the optic nerve, all of the axons on the brain side of that crush site die. And some of the axons on the eye side will survive, 
but they do not regenerate back to the brain. Again, this is why under normal circumstances, glaucomatous vision loss is permanent. But a number of uh, scientists have discovered several different molecular pathways that when experimentally manipulated, actually allow these retinoganglion cell axons to regrow their fibers through the optic nerve. And in some cases, those fibers can go tremendously long distances, several millimeters through the entirety of the optic nerve, through the optic chiasm, and even end up in some of those very special regions of the brain that are necessary to receive input from the eye in order to support vision. Um, and in some cases, this even led to the restoration of visually guided behaviors in mice. In other words, mice subjected to an optic nerve crush injury could be made to see again to some extent by allowing these um, retinoganglion cell axons to regenerate to the brain. So there is a precedent for RGCs that have made their way into the retina being able to reconstitute the optic nerve and restore those connections between the eye and the brain. We just need to figure out how to do that with stem cell derived RGCs. So the point I'm trying to make is I think we are now at a critical juncture where there's been enough progress in scientific knowledge and technique development that restoration of vision and optic nerve regeneration for glaucoma may actually be feasible with the right sources. I, I don't think it's necessarily science fiction anymore. It's now scientific possibility. So I'm going to move on to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing over the last few years uh, to begin to develop methodologies for transplanting human stem cell derived RGCs into eyes to regenerate the optic nerve. First, I'm gonna show you one of the first experiments that we did here. You're gonna see some red human RGCs that were transplanted into the eyes of mice. And this is a three-dimensional confocal microscopy rendering so that you can see this tissue in three dimensions. Uh, coming in and out of this video are, is labeling of the mouse's own retina in blue. And you can see here that these human RGCs sit on the surface of the retina and they grow neurites, they grow axons and dendrites and processes in two dimensions on the surface of the retina. But what they don't do is send dendrite processes down into the retina. And as we discussed, that's completely necessary in order for them to begin receiving information about light from the bipolar cells of the retina. So while it's exciting that these cells survive and grow neurites, uh, this really represented an early failure because it demonstrated that these RGCs that we transplanted had absolutely no ability to restore vision because they weren't receiving any information about light that the retina that they were transplanted into detected. So our work for a couple of years aimed to figure out why that was the case and overcome that problem. And we had a hypothesis that the structure that is at the absolute surface of the retina, which is called the internal limiting membrane or the ILM, might be a barrier that prevents transplanted RGCs from engrafting into the retina. And here you're looking at another three-dimensional reconstruction of uh, human RGCs that have been transplanted onto a retina. And in this case, we've labeled the ILM in green. And it just so happened that in this particular retina, there was an area where the ILM tore, probably because this is where uh, the needle entered the eye in order to transplant these RGCs. And the interesting thing about this particular uh, block of tissue was that if we computationally removed the most superficial uh, slices of this tissue and sort of peered underneath the internal limiting membrane of this same section, you can see that there were human RGCs that were migrating into the host retinal tissue. They gained access to the retina in this area where the ILM was torn, and then they migrated laterally underneath the ILM. And this gave us a, an early suspicion 
that perhaps if we were able to purposefully create breaks or tears or holes in the ILM, that might enable transplanted RGCs to access the retina. And so we developed some techniques to disrupt the ILM. Here, you're looking again at the retina in a top-down view. And in the case of a normal, healthy retina with an intact ILM, you see just a homogeneous flat sheet of internal limiting membrane staining. But when we either inject an, uh, a proteolytic enzyme into the eyeball a couple weeks ahead of time uh, in order to eat holes or digest the internal limiting membrane, or in a specific type of transgenic mouse that we've identified, uh, that develops uh, spontaneous holes in its ILM during development, you can see this sort of Swiss cheese appearance to the ILM. They've, the ILM forms these large holes that are big enough to allow retinal ganglion cells to migrate through and gain access to the neural retina underneath. So now I'm going to show you a couple more videos again. On the left is the case of an intact internal limiting membrane, very similar to that video I showed you before, where those retinoganglion cells sit on the surface of the retina and do not send processes down into the retinal tissue. In contrast, when we purposefully disrupt the internal limiting membrane, now you can see that these RGCs are sending dendrites into the retinal tissue, where they have the ability to now interact with bipolar cells and potentially form those communication stations that will allow them to receive information about light entering the eye. We've done this in a couple of ways, and this is just one example of an experimental schematic for how we do this. We inject this special enzyme two weeks prior to transplantation, and this enzyme fills the back part of the eye and then chews holes in the ILM uh, generally without causing other damaging effects to other structures in the eye. And then two weeks later, we inject human stem cell-derived retinoganglion cells behind the lens into the vitreous cavity. And then after two weeks, we look at the retina to see what these retinoganglion cells have done. This is an example of a mouse retina that we have uh, prepared for histology. We've flattened it out. And these red uh, cells here are our transplanted human RGCs. Uh, this is relatively low magnification, but on the left here, what I wanna point out is there are uh, hundreds of RGCs which have survived the transplantation process. And remarkably, a number of them are spontaneously sending axons directly to the optic nerve head. We were surprised by this finding, but it's actually a, a very fortuitous thing that the transplanted RGCs seem to know how to get out of the eye and begin their journey uh, towards the brain. When we look at the individual RGCs at higher magnification, you can see that they have these nice dendrites coming out of the cell body. And when we do a three-dimensional analysis of these dendrites in tissue, we see that in the context of internal limiting membrane disruption, these uh, neurites are actually entering the retina and they're localizing very specifically to the correct layer of the retina where those communication stations with bipolar cells can actually take place. You can see here in this cross section where I've labeled the host retina in blue, the retina has this beautiful layered architecture where the photoreceptors are in this uh, bottommost layer here. The bipolar cells are in this middle layer right here. And the retinoganglion cells exist in this single cell layer at the top. In between the retinoganglion cell layer and the bipolar cell layer, you have an area that's basically black on this picture. And that's because there are no cell bodies located within this layer. This layer of the retina is called the inner plexiform layer. And it's very specifically the part of the retina where synapses between retinoganglion cell dendrites and bipolar cell axons occur. So the fact that this retinoganglion cell has sent its dendrites into the inner plexiform layer suggests that it's in the exact right location 
in order to form communication stations with bipolar cells. Now, sometimes these two-dimensional pictures are a little bit difficult to interpret. So I want to show you another movie here uh, that is a fly-through of a tissue section where we've transplanted. In this case, there are three human RGCs, and one of them that we're tracing here so that you can see in greater detail has engrafted into the retina, meaning its cell body is located within the host retinoganglion cell layer, and its dendrites are extending laterally within the inner plexiform layer. Again, that deeper layer where they actually are in the correct position to begin forming communication stations or synapses with the bipolar cells of the retina. Now, our work is very translational. Again, it's great that we can do this in mice and rats, but obviously our ultimate goal is to develop therapies that will apply to human patients with glaucoma. And so we've done some experiments to check whether our disruption of the internal limiting membrane technique also works to enhance the engraftment of stem cells transplanted onto human retina. Now, for safety reasons, we obviously can't do this in living human patients yet, uh, but we have been able to obtain uh, human eyes from postmortem donors that have donated their uh, eyes to science, and we have created organotypic cultures of retinal biopsies from these, ret from these eyes and cultured them for a period of a week and transplanted human RGCs onto the surface of these uh, retinal explant cultures. And we found the same thing in this context that we did with uh, the mice, where it, the disruption of the internal limiting membrane enabled dramatically more transplanted RGCs to engraft into the recipient retina. Now, the next stage of our work is focusing not just on the structure and localization of these RGCs, which is what I've shown you up until now, but focusing more on the actual function, the electrophysiology of these cells. And in order to do this, we're uh, using a technique called uh, optical electrophysiology or calcium imaging. So to explain this briefly, uh, there is a molecule that is a derivative of a protein called green fluorescent protein. Now that green fluorescent protein, as you'd expect, uh, fluoresces green under a fluorescent microscope. But this derivative molecule uh, is able to change the brightness of its fluorescence in a way that correlates with the amount of calcium that is inside the cell that's expressing this protein. Now, why might that be important? Well, calcium is a critical signaling uh, molecule for neurons. When neurons become excited and start firing action potentials and um, uh, are signaling high levels of activity, the doing so increases dramatically the amount of calcium that's inside that cell. And when neurons are uh, quiescent or quiet or not being very active, the intracellular calcium levels are low. So when you have a neuron that is expressing this G-CAMP molecule, this calcium sensing molecule, you can tell how electrophysiologically active that neuron is based on how bright its green fluorescence is. Now here on the right, I'm showing you a movie of a retina under the microscope. And you can see here that there are some dim cells uh, scattered throughout the surface of this retina. These are retinoganglion cells that are expressing this G-CAMP molecule. And at 10 seconds, you suddenly see a whole bunch of them become much, much brighter for about a second or two, and then they become dim again. The reason for that was that at the 10 second mark, we actually flashed a bright light at the retina that light was detected by the photoreceptors in the retina. Those photoreceptors then sent that signal about the light to the bipolar cells. And those bipolar cells transmitted that information to the retinoganglion cells you're looking at here. And the brightness of these cells at the 10 second mark 
tells us that these retinoganglion cells were becoming electrophysiologically more active because they received information about light from the host retina. Now, this uh, movie that I'm showing you right now uh, is not transplanted RGCs. These are endogenous RGCs of a mouse's retina. And so you'd expect that the RGCs would be light because we know that they're hooked up already to the retinal circuitry of the mouse's retina. But we've developed the tools and uh, cloned some stem cell lines that will now allow us to test this same modality to see if our transplanted RGCs are light responsive the same way that these endogenous RGCs are. So beyond that, what's next? How do we plan to move forward to actually uh, reaching a stage where we can try something like stem cell transplantation in human subjects. Well, all the work that I've talked about so far has been conducted in mice and rats. And as you can see here, the mouse eye is extremely tiny in comparison to a human eye. Uh, it is so tiny that there are certain things that we simply cannot do in mice that we could do in, and we do do routinely in human patients. Um, so in order to start to develop the surgical tools and applications and techniques that we are going to need to figure out what are the best ways to transplant stem cell derived RGCs into human subjects, we're beginning to do some work with non-human primates, with rhesus macaques. These have an eyeball that has a very similar anatomy to that of humans, but it's just about 75% the size. One of the things that we're gonna do uh, in the non-human primates that we can't do in mice is instead of disrupting the internal limiting membrane by injecting enzymes into the eye, we can just peel the internal limiting membrane directly off the surface of the eye. And that might sound a little bit crazy, but believe it or not, this is something that's actually already done in human patients routinely. The, the movie that you're looking at right here is a surgical video that was given to me by a colleague of mine, Dr. Jim Handa. So Dr. Handa is a vitro retinal surgeon here at Johns Hopkins, and this is a human patient where the ILM has been stained with a green dye, and he is peeling it off the surface of the eye to treat a condition called macular hole. So uh, in future experiments, Dr. Handa is going to use this exact same technique to peel the internal limiting membrane off of non-human primates, and then we're going to be transplanting human stem cell-derived RGCs directly onto the retinal tissue to see how well they engraft in that context. So going back to the original uh, lay of the land here, as far as the many obstacles that need to be overcome... Uh, I'll again admit that this is an ambitious uh, project, an ambitious goal that we have, but I think we are making strong headway. We have RGCs now that we can make from stem cells of any human, uh, any patient that exists. We know how to transplant those cells into the eye. Right now, a subset of them will migrate and survive and get into the retina. And one of our goals right now is to figure out how we can increase the survival of these cells over time and increase the efficiency of our transplants. We've shown that we can get dendrites to grow into the retina where they're able to synapse with bipolar cells. And now we have to figure out how to get these transplanted RGC axons to go out through the back of the eye and enter the brain. Um, that's work in progress, but as I noted, there's uh, a tremendous amount of precedent for this and a number of really good molecular candidates that we're going to be looking at uh, to try to drive this process forward. So by putting all of these puzzle pieces together, uh, I think that in the next few years, we will be able to achieve a unified comprehensive protocol that allows us to replace retinoganglion cells throughout the entirety of the visual pathway. Now, I want to acknowledge this is absolutely not something that I could do in isolation or even uh, my lab members and I could do as a small group. Uh, this is a huge team effort. Um, and you know, I think that's commensurate with the scope of the challenge that we're facing. So here at Hopkins, 
we're working with people that have very diverse expertise. Uh, Don Zak is a molecular biologist and stem cell biologist. Alex Kolodkin is a developmental neuroscientist. Uh, we have several outstanding clinicians, including Harry Quigley, who's a glaucoma specialist, and also Neil Miller and Amanda Henderson, who are neuro-ophthalmologists, because we really think that this approach will apply not only to patients with glaucoma, but potentially any optic neuropathy, including ischemic optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, traumatic optic neuropathy, and other things. Uh, I told you about uh, Jim Handa, who's the vitreo retinal surgeon, who's going to be actually developing the surgical techniques that we hope will one day be used in human subjects. GE is a biomedical engineer who is building some advanced microscopy equipment for us. And Laura Ensign is a biomedical engineer that's building uh, some scaffolds and tools that will actually be used to house these retinal ganglion cells during transplantation. Uh, as a final note, though, I want to let everyone know that this work and the interest and the passion for developing new therapies for patients with glaucoma transcends even those of us at Johns Hopkins. Uh, last year, we founded a consortium called the Retinoganglion Cell Repopulation, Stem Cell Transplantation, and Optic Nerve Regeneration, or RESTORE, consortium. Uh, I'm the chairman of the consortium, but there are 12 organizing committee members and over 200 scientists worldwide that have complementary skill sets and expertise that are all working together to try to move the field forward uh, towards clinical translation. If anyone is interested in learning more about Restore, you can go to restore.info or even snap uh, a picture of this QR code with your phone. So uh, with that, I thank everyone for your attention. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, I'm always uh, happy to chat. This is my email address, johnson at jhmi.edu. And uh, I think we have some time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for this fascinating presentation and for giving us a glimpse into the future. We have a lot of questions and I have to apologize in advance. I know we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll do our best. Let's just start. Okay, let's see. If created RGCs are transplanted, what are the compatibility requirements to the recipient? Is there a risk of rejection? Great question. Um, in theory, there may be. Anytime you transplant cells or organs uh, into a uh, human, uh, their body may reject it if it's coming from another individual. So if you're at all uh, familiar with things like kidney, liver, lung transplants, uh, patients that receive donor organs often have to be on systemic immunosuppression, drugs that uh, prevent the immune system from rejecting the graft. Um, I, it, it's interesting that the, the eye is considered an immunoprivileged organ, which used to uh, convey the idea that if you transplant something into the eye, it couldn't be rejected. I think we now know that it's more complicated than that. There is immune surveillance of the eye and the retina and uh, cells that are transplanted into the eye can be rejected. But I think the tolerance of the eye for transplanted cells is um, somewhat higher than for other types of organs. Uh, so eventually, I guess the questions are, uh, will human patients that may be subject to transplantation in the future need to be on immune suppression? Uh, and that's possible. But one of the great things about stem cells is um, uh, that we now can create stem cells from any individual. You know, if you went back uh, 20 years ago, there were only embryonic stem cells that could be used. And there was only a finite number of embryonic stem cell lines in existence that scientists could work with. And then in 2006, Shinya Yamanaka uh, published a paper on a technique where you can take uh, adult 
cells like skin cells, blood cells, and reprogram them into induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. He won the Nobel Prize for this finding a few years later. And now, like I said, we can actually create stem cells from anyone. So perhaps one of the more attractive uh, possibilities would be that if you have a patient with glaucoma that you want to treat, you might begin by taking a blood sample or a skin biopsy and creating induced pluripotent stem cells from that patient, and then taking those stem cells, turning those into RGCs through directed differentiation, and then transplant those cells back into the same patient. If you did that, there would be complete immunological compatibility for that patient and they would not be rejected and the patient wouldn't even need to take some of those potentially toxic immunosuppressive drugs. Thank you so much. Next question. Do you know if there is a link between glaucoma and Parkinson's? Uh, so I, there are numerous studies which purport to find links of various sorts between glaucoma and other neurodegenerative diseases. Parkinson's is one of them. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is another. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to this question. I think uh, from a scientific standpoint, there are many overlaps with uh, the fact that a very specific type of central nervous system neuron is being targeted for degeneration. In Parkinson's disease, it is dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra. In glaucoma, it's retinal ganglion cells of the retina. Um, but the, the triggers for these diseases are different. And, um, you know, I think one of the questions that's often on the minds of patients with glaucoma is, uh, if I have glaucoma, does that mean I'm at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease? Are these uh, sort of two ends of a spectrum of disease? And I think the evidence for that is uh, much, much weaker. There have been some epidemiologic studies that find that patients with glaucoma, for instance, might have a higher rate of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's than patients without glaucoma. The problem is that a lot of those studies are subject to different sorts of confounding effects and biases that sometimes make the difficult the, the data difficult to interpret. So, you know, patients that have glaucoma, for instance, are often seeing a doctor, they're in a healthcare system, they're being evaluated, and so they're more likely to also be evaluated by a neurologist or be referred for. Uh, certain things which may lead to a diagnosis of other neurodegenerative diseases. So, you know, if I, if a patient of mine in clinic has glaucoma and uh, asks me, does this mean I'm at higher risk for Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease? I generally tell them that I don't think there's enough good evidence to suggest that that's true uh, to, to think that that's something to worry about. Thank you very much. Next question. It's exciting that disruption of ILM allows RGCs to grow and integrate, but does disruption of ILM itself damage the site? Great question. Uh, so the answer is no. Uh, the ILM is a really important structure for the development of the eye. And we know this uh, through studies, again, of mice. Uh, there are animal models of mutant mice that have defects in the protein uh, structure of the internal limiting membrane that causes it to form in abnormal ways. And there are mutant mice that have defects in the molecules uh, that are uh, expressed on the surfaces of the RGCs that allow them to sense the ILM and know where the ILM is located in the retina. And if you either disrupt the ILM or disrupt the sensing of the ILM within the RGCs while the eye is forming and the retina is developing, it causes major problems for the RGCs. They migrate out of the retina, they migrate into the wrong locations in the retina, and the retina itself develops this sort of um, disorganized architecture. However, after the retina has completed development, 
the ILM is completely dispensable. And we know that because of work in these patients where the ILM is peeled. Um, there are conditions like macular hole and vitreomacular traction where adhesions between the vitreous, the jelly inside the back of the eye, and the ILM cause traction and it causes a pulling force on the retina that can either distort the retina or cause uh, cavities to form within the retina, or in the most uh, dramatic cases, can cause the retina to just split and uh, there actually to be a, a hole in the center of the vision. And vitreoretinal surgeons, like I showed you in that video, can peel the ILM off the surface of the retina. And generally speaking, uh, it doesn't uh, hurt the vision. And in patients that have macular holes, it actually allows a better uh, visual outcome for the patient than if their hole remained. Now, you know, are, is there nuance to this? Of course, uh, during the ILM peeling, uh, and uh, histological specimens of the ILM that's come out of the eye have been looked at. And in fact, there are pieces of retinal cells that are stuck to the ILM that are torn off of the retina when the ILM comes out. And if you look very closely, there are detectable changes in some of the electroretinographic uh, measurements of the retina after an ILM peel. So uh, would you want to take somebody that has perfect 20-20 vision and peel the ILM? Uh, would that be completely safe? Probably not. I think that would lead to a slight worsening of vision. But we know that if somebody has a macular hole and has 2100 vision, then peeling the ILM may cause a little bit of damage, collateral damage to the retina, but uh, it's going to be better for the patient overall to uh, have that procedure to close the hole. And the last point is um, when thinking about the patients that would be treated with the therapy we're talking about here, uh, they would likely have very little or no residual function of their inner retina anyway. Their retinal ganglion cells would be mostly or completely lost at the time of treatment. And so the added risk of an ILM peel for those patients, I think, would be negligible. Thank you so much. Uh, I apologize to everybody whose question will remain unanswered. We have time for one more question, and I think it's the question everybody wants to hear an answer to, and it's, if you had to venture a guess, how many years we are away from human trials? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a question, and probably the most frequent question I'm asked, and it's an incredibly difficult question to answer, and the reason is... Uh, you know, it, once we get to the point where in a preclinical model, like a non-human primate, we are able to uh, successfully transplant RGCs and restore vision in a monkey, then I think we have a pretty understandable timetable uh, time of what's required from a logistical standpoint to file paperwork with FDA and begin oversight and clinical trials. At this point, um, I would say if everything works perfectly the first time around uh, for every experiment that we do, it still may be seven to 10 years uh, before we can try this in human patients. Now, of course, uh, the more resources we have, the more people we have working on this problem, the faster experiments can be performed and the faster that would go. Um, but uh, on the flip side, you know, it's uh, possible or maybe even likely that some of the experiments we do will not work. And maybe the retinal ganglion cell axons will make their way to the brain, but go to the wrong location. And then we may need to take some additional time to figure out how to guide those axons or target them to the correct location. So I think, um, you know, as we conduct this research, uh, sometimes the research leads to more questions than answers, and only further experiments can answer those questions. So I think that's probably the best answer I can give at this point, and hopefully in the coming years, uh, the timing of all of this will become clearer. Thank you so much. We've reached the end of our webinar. I would like to thank Dr. Johnson again for amazing presentation. 
for conducting science that was science fiction even a few years ago and for giving patients so much hope, even though it's some years away. I would like to thank our audience for joining us, for asking great questions, for being interested in what you do. Stay connected to us and thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody.